But we need a safe space where we can come and, and commune together and, you know, collectively, even coffee enthusiasts or people like me can come and try new things uh, without the hustle and bustle of kind of the big chain coffee shop. Early in the morning, I wake up and I go and grind. Early in the morning, I wake up and I go and grind. Early in the morning, I wake up and I go and grind and say the world is mine. Man, I say early in the morning, I wake up and I go and grind. Early in the morning, I wake up and I go and grind. Early in the morning, I wake up and I go and grind and say the world is mine. Man. I say early in the morning you wake up and you go and grind early in the morning you wake up and you go and grind early in the morning you wake up and you go and grind and say the world is mine name is DJ Johnson part of the reason open for the company it was one i just wanted to create a hub for education and a white man in the space where people can come and engage in interpersonal communication i always envisioned like this space being one of the places where people go to discuss like some of the world's greatest issues just engage in thought-provoking conversation um so the idea was coming back to my old community i said man when i was growing up i would love that but i had a bookstore that my brothers and i could go to engage in literature, discussion, reading, you know, good, just a really nice atmosphere mm -hmm. that represented a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in New Orleans, you really don't have a lot of spaces like that, especially growing up in the 80s when I grew up. Like in the 80s, this neighborhood looked completely different. Like New Orleans was just a different city. Um, uh, so the time that I was growing up, you didn't have anything like this. I didn't want children of this generation to experience the same thing. So I said, man, you know what? We always talk about gentrification going on in our communities. We always talk about the lack of access to literature, the lack of access to books, the lack of access to opportunities, the lack of access to mentors. So I said, let me be that. Instead of just talking about it, let me do something about it. Hi. Welcome to the Black Coffee Company. I'm Shannon. Hello, I'm one of the co-owners, Chris Boulder. So Black Coffee was actually started um, a, a, amongst a group of friends from Xavier University. We actually graduated from Xavier, um, traveled the world together, party, hung out, spent a lot of money. And one thing we realized is that we weren't bringing anything back in and we weren't building something to celebrate. So it wasn't until a trip to Motown where one of our really close family members was graduating from Michigan State University. Uh, we went to the Motown Museum and while touring the Motown Museum, we heard the story of Motown. And a lot of people don't know that Barry Gordy, when he founded Motown, it was actually started with an investment from his family. So what they did was pull their resources, came together, and when it was time to get married or put down a down payment on a home, they would have a family group discussion, pitch the idea, vote on it, and provide funding. So a light bulb went off in our heads and we decided, hey, that sounds amazing. So let's go ahead and start to pull our resources. So we started an investment club and we started pulling our resources together. Every month we put money into the pot and use that to invest and trade on the stock market. Once we got successful at that and we started to get our bearings, we decided we wanted to steer the community in the direction of financial freedom. And in doing so, we decided to start a business. So we all decided to, you know, pitch ideas, come up with what we thought would be best, um, the best product to provide. And through our research, we found that coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world, second to oil. And so we decided, can't mess that up. Let's go ahead and try out coffee. And so black coffee was birthed. And um, 
black and the meaning of black coffee can be a variety of different things. For me, I take my coffee black. So that's one of the reasons why we call it black coffee. But also a lot of people don't know that coffee originated in Ethiopia, which is a motherland, which is black. And so black coffee can mean a myriad of different things. Take with it what you will, but black encompasses everything that we do. And that's why we have black coffee in every cup. I'm Jason Card from Ology Coffee. Ology Coffee started with a fusion between um, Journeyman Coffee, which was my coffee company, and Ology Brewing. Um, I've been working at Ology Brewing for almost since they opened as a bartender, mostly part-time, and on the side doing Journeyman Coffee, various pop-ups and a couple of uh, shared space locations, a, couple, a bunch of different stuff, trying everything basically to see what works. Um, and then uh, Ology Brewing has always been interested in doing coffee. And we finally kind of came together. It seemed like COVID was happening and it was a, a time to improvise and try some new stuff because everything was weird. <laughs> so we, we started doing a little walk up window at the brewery uh, one day a week, just selling coffee and then going to the farmer's market. And then we just kind of been, been building it up from there. And now we're, I guess we're really established now. <laughs> um, I started doing coffee because I was looking for a job. I just moved to a new town. Um, and I had my wife had got a job and I was just looking for anything and I was hanging out in a coffee shop all day like filling out applications and they always seem to be having so much fun behind the bar that I started applying there and it, it took nine months of like kind of off and on asking them for a job and working another job and finally somebody I think moved to France very suddenly and they found themselves needing somebody so I ended up working um, and for, I don't know, for the first year, it was just, it was fun. Um, I didn't really care about coffee at all. I just was just working. Uh, and then suddenly I started like, I don't remember what the first thing was, but I started getting really into coffee. I started reading, I started wanting to read some coffee books and learn a lot more stuff. Right then, like the only person I knew who knew anything about coffee left the company and moved. And so I was kind of on my own. I started tracking down some books and like just trying to teach myself stuff. And then I, I fell in really deep. <laughs> Mom got sick, ended up relocating back to New Orleans to take care of my mother, purchased these properties. And I said, well, okay, this is my opportunity to not just talk about gentrification, but do something about it. This is my opportunity to not just say, man, these kids need something to do after school. Like, why ain't nobody doing something with these kids after school? Okay, let me give them something to do after school. So one of the things with Baldwin Corporate Company that we're doing is, developing after school programs, mm -hmm. tutoring programs, mentoring programs, book fairs, book festivals, literacy programs, book clubs, all for kids to engage in, to show them the importance of reading and give them an opportunity to improve their situation. Let's go. So why do uh, you decide to base the, the coffee shop here in Atlanta, Georgia? To be honest, um, Atlanta chose us. So uh, we started out with our Woke Mug, which is the first product that we launched online. Um, our online presence was one of the main reasons why we're actually here. And we did a pop-up shop. So um, Killer Mike invited us for his Juneteenth event last year to be one of the black businesses that he um, showcased. So he chose a lot of black businesses to um, be on a block party type setup. And so we served our coffee, it re went really well. And then he actually reached out to us for an opportunity. The building that we're in is full of black businesses. So it's full of a uh, black owned spa, restaurants, doctor's offices. And they asked everybody, well, what is missing from this? What do you guys need? And, Everyone was like, well, a coffee shop, somewhere we can go to, you know, um, congregate together, get coffee, get food. So we were kind of invited and asked to be here by Killer Mike and his associates, Omar, who owns the business. So it was a great opportunity in this area. A lot of it's being gentrified and they're trying to keep a lot of um, the businesses, homes and everything in the black community. 
So it's an up and coming area. Um, in Atlanta, of course, um, the inner city is kind of getting taken up. So everything's starting to expand out. So this is one of the areas that is quickly being built back up and it's gonna be kind of like a new black men town. Like where the coffee comes from and where and the drinkers, like it kind of connects various parts of the world. Um, it kind of touches everywhere. And that's, that's really exciting. So you a reason to learn about other places that you that might not know anything about um, and it connects you with people that you might not otherwise meet. Um, and then also like coffee shops are also like that on a smaller scale for the community. You, you know, people just kind of wander by and it's like, oh, here's a coffee shop, I'm gonna go get some coffee. And then, so you meet, you meet people you might never see even if you live in, you know, a small town like Tallahassee. It's sometimes like living on several different islands um, and you meet people that yeah, you would have just never run into. Um, and then you usually get a chance to sit down and talk to them for a minute, which is also not, not something we have a lot of. <laughs> You know, you just pass them down the street and just start chatting because that's not really, <laughs> especially with COVID, that's really not how it works now. <laughs> Come on, down the street, man. That's a stand, that's a title. Man, they ain't called, you know. <laughs> so, 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 you know, so that's how it, you know, I used to I always just look at it, I was like, man, if I ever get money, if I ever get the opportunity, I'm going to open up a gym. It's going to be like running shoes, going to be a community <laughs> space. Kids going to be able to come and play basketball. Um, and then I started looking, I was like, and as I got older and matured, I was like, you know what? I want a bookstore. Mm -hmm. I want to go to a bookstore. I think that's more impactful. Yeah. I love gyms and, you know, um, I think that a bookstore would be more impactful. When I first started telling the people, even family, like, started telling people, oh, yeah, I'm open books, I'm open books. So, one, everybody thought I was crazy. Because there's a misnomer, even in the black community, everybody was like, black people don't read. Black people don't read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you sure you want to do this? Because black people don't read. So then, you know, I was like, well, it's going to be a coffee shop also. The coffee is going to supplement the lack of book sales. You know, um, you know, I understand the book industry. It's a it's a hard industry to be in yeah. because of Amazon and you got the big box stores like Barnes and Nobles and they're going to offer real mm -hmm. discount pricing. I say, I understand that. I said, yes, and it's going to be mostly black centered books. I say, yes, and I, 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 I know we, we, we struggle in reading sometimes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in our community. So I recognize that. So I said, but you know what? You know what's going to offset that? Coffee sales. Why they thought I was crazy? Because they said, man, you know what? That's a good idea to add coffee to it. It's a bad idea to open a coffee shop across the street from Starbucks in the PJs. You're just full of bad ideas. Man, you know what? I have a firm belief that there's always room for the best. There's just always space for the best. Well, that's my belief. <laughs> Community is really happy, especially people that live around here because there's not a lot of businesses that they can go to to get food, beverages, things. So um, we're happy to be here and we're happy to have a service to the community and be of service to the community. Well, we actually created this actual space um, to be a networking um, space for the community. Um, so uh, we have workstations here for people to conduct business, um, study. We also have a area designated for the community where you can come in and have group meetings, uh, discussion groups. Um, uh, we, on Sundays, we actually have a yoga group that comes in um, every other Sunday. And we provide yoga, which is good for mental health and just overall community awareness and, you know, just a place to be able to unwind, be comfortable and be yourself. This machine, some machines will put through a certain volume of water and shut themselves off. We don't have one of those. We, uh, we are going to stop it and start it manually. It's called a semi-automatic machine. All right, so we'll put it in here. Get that nice and tight. Set this underneath. I'll tear again. I'll turn this. 
I'm hoping that's gonna tear. I try to always be teaching people because it's got to be constantly bringing new people in, uh, whether they work in coffee or they just get interested in it. It's like always like just sharing that whatever knowledge we have and I mean it, more more sharing like the interest and the passion even than the knowledge like you teach somebody a little bit of something and then encourage them to want to learn more and then that's how you get I mean, how you get devoted customers how you get more people involved in what we're doing um, and hopefully this all trickles down to like making farmers have you know more sustainable income like that's a lot of what underlies everything at least in the intent I'm not sure that we're managing to do it as well as we should but that's 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 part of the idea behind it it's like make that whole that whole supply chain sustainable and like the baristas to the farmers and everyone in the middle I simply want to be able to raise my children in peace and arrive at my own maturity in my own way, in peace. I don't want to be defined by you. I think that you and I might learn a great deal from each other. If you can overcome the curtain of my color, the curtain of my color is what you use to avoid facing the facts of our common history, the facts of American life. Of course, James Baldwin is one of my favorite authors. So it's so funny. So my brothers, we all kind of like took to like different different authors and my sisters, we all kind of like took to different authors and we all kind of like have our favorites. Um, and um, for certain reasons, I recognize now, I didn't recognize it when I was younger, but I recognize now why I gravitated toward James Baldwin. Um, like I have another brother, he gravitated toward W.B. Du Bois. I have mm -hmm. another brother, he gravitated toward Langston Hughes. So I know why I gravitated toward James Baldwin, but James Baldwin is just one of my favorites uh, of mm -hmm. all time. Um, but I love um, Ernest Gaines. I remember reading him as as a child, yeah. as a yeah. local author. Um, just I, um, I read a lot of nonfiction. So I let I read W. B. Du Bois. Uh, I read um, Dick Gregory as a younger. I read Carter G. Woodson is probably like my favorite. Man, I tell people I said, man, I read The Miseducation of the Negro when I was fifteen years old. Yeah. You know, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I might have been 12. So I had an older brother in my, and I wanted to do everything my older brother did. So growing up, I wanted to be like him. So he's reading the autobiography from Malcolm X. So it's on the kitchen table. One day I pick it up. I'm like, wow, this is powerful. I love this. Um, and then my dad made sure that when the movie came out, he took us to see the movie. Um, my dad is really big on black empowerment, black excellence. Um, um, it was a time we couldn't watch a movie if it wasn't from the black star and then mm -hmm. couldn't read a book it was written by a black author. So um so I grew up reading like W. B. Du Bois and Dick Gregory and Carter G. Woodson and Richard Wright, um uh, Zoe Neil Hurston, those were the books that I was reading at the time. Um and then we were sprinkling in the, the little young adult the novels. Mm -hmm. Um but for the most part, man, I was like reading like, straight just black and common fiction, black and white men just celebrating like who we are as blacks and our greatness. Um, because my parents they realized we had to they had to combat the white inferior or the black inferiority complex that was being portrayed in the media. Mm -hmm. So they just poured it in us. I worked at a shop once that closed, well, I had worked there for a long time and it closed really suddenly and left everybody kind of back a few paychecks. So um, we set up, I set up another coffee shop, let me set up inside of their shop and we did a bunch of hand brewed coffee just for donations. I just bought a bunch of coffee and donated it to the cause and then just took all the money, like I just had everybody put all the cash in a jar and we just, you know, donated it to the GoFundMe to try to get those people some money that they 
we're short for a couple weeks of work. Like there's a lot of baristas around town and sometimes they'll have an idea and they're like, hey, I want to do a pop-up for this. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's do it. Let's figure it out. Let's get some coffee. Let's, let's find a location. Um, let's do it. Um, most of the time I'll see you know, somebody doing like GoFundMe and raising money for something and I'm like, we should kick into that. And, you know, we'll, we'll start gathering people up. It's, it's pretty informal. I realized on the last one, we, we bought a bunch of coffee from uh, New Orleans Roasters um, after the hurricane. Uh, just to kind of try and help them out a little bit and did, did a pop-up and you know raise awareness of who they were you know which kind of who people were roasting in new orleans that kind of thing i feel like there's also there's like community building in the greater community and then there's also community building in the coffee people because we got to support each other uh, we got to bring in new people we got to keep keep it's hard to not get burned out uh, it can be a tough job and it's not often very it's rewarding but often you gotta like kind of look for the reward in it. Um, it's very easy to get bogged down in the, just the day-to-day -day of it. And if we can kind of support each other, give each other a little bit of a place to vent, a place to, to talk, a place to get excited about things, then it makes it much easier to, to stay engaged. My biggest takeaway with starting your coffee business or any um, entrepreneurial um, goal that you have for yourself is to trust the process. You know, a lot of people want to steer you in the, into their direction or, you know, measure success based on what they consider, consider success. But for us, we pride ourselves on getting it out the mud. And what that means is, you know, we started online. We started doing pop-ups all over the country. And we also just started getting it out to Trump, you know, touching the people, reaching out. And that gave us, you know, the opportunity to be able to open up our retail space. Um, a lot of businesses, while they were pivoting to online during COVID, we were able to circumvent that because we started online and were able to get our bearings in that and be able to go ahead and set the stepping stones to being able to open a brick and mortar shop. So a lot of the issues, a lot of the you know, failures and things that we went through. Um, achieving the, the coffee shop came from, you know, doing events out in the public without electricity and things of that nature. So running a coffee shop and having an actual physical location is the easy part. Yeah. One of the things that Baldwin & Co. will do, we will fight mass incarceration through literacy. There is direct correlation between literacy and mass incarceration. They build prisons off of third grade test scores, not just general test scores, but reading comprehension test scores. Your literacy test scores is how they build, they determine how many prisons they're going to build. If we can combat that, then we stop and combat mass incarceration. You can't police. There's not enough policing to stop mass incarceration. If there was a police officer, every single human being, they still would not be able to stop crime. Mm. You have to give people intrinsic motivation to want to succeed, to want to do better, but you have to give them opportunity. You have to give them the encouragement and the confidence that they can go out and they can achieve things because a lot of kids today who are committing crimes, particularly in New Orleans, a lot of these kids who are committing crimes, they don't know that they can be better, that there's more opportunity. They can have a better life, but they don't know that because they lack reading, they lack education. So what we want to do is we want to say, hey, we want to give you the opportunity. We want to give you the resources. We want to give you the tools to be successful. Literacy is the number one tool to be successful. There's another study that came out that showed that novel study in school, literacy, encouragement, and reading novels in school have a far greater impact on brain structure, brain activity, and changing the brain and how it learns. Not only that, it impacts your math scores, history, and science. So reading novels 
and this just wasn't taught when I was in school, but it's 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 current studies that have shown mm -hmm. reading novels today will help you more in math, in science, in history class. So we have to encourage these kids to become readers because it opens up just a wide range of imagination. You know, um, people, you know, they look at me and they say, man, how did you envision this? Like, because I designed it. Every single thing you see, I designed. I was the GC, every single piece of design, the walls, the, the, the way the books are laid, the tile, the way the tile flows into the wood. It's my design. It's because my imagination, it doesn't stop growing. Einstein said imagination is more important than intelligence. Mm -hmm. You have to feed that imagination in these kids. These kids don't have no imagination. They don't know what's possible. Give them a book in front of their hand. Show them what's possible. Help cultivate that imagination, cultivate that success. So what Baldwin and Co. will do is we're going to combat crime. We're going to fight crime through literacy. 78% of the prison population today read at a fourth grade or below level. That tells you that there's a direct correlation. We're going to fight that. Wake up! If they've been sleeping on you. If they've been sleeping on you. Uh, if they've been sleeping on you. Look, I tell them, wake up! If they've been sleeping on you. If they've been sleeping on you, if they've been sleeping on you, open your eyes, rise and shine. Hope you ready for ascension. This that type of funkadelic that's gonna hit you different. Can you stand the rain? Your new addition gonna be dripping. If you add the proper upgrade to your prototype, you witness it successful on the market. Uh -huh. Maybe you should change your target. Uh -huh. Go so your soul has a healthy crop to harvest. Yes. Cause what's a man that feed his flesh, believe his spirit starving. Yes. Money don't mean nothing if your mental not evolving. Wake up! If they been sleeping on it. Uh, if they been sleeping on it. Uh, if they been sleeping on it. Look, I tell them, wake up.